couple of months of abundant sunlight, why don't you switch to solar? Never stay in the dark, save big. From your home, office or the streets, solar is the best. Switch to solar and save money. Panels, batteries, inverters. Unique energy. 224-7777 Info at uniqueenergygm.com The difference between us and other media houses is that we have the best quality materials. Working here, it's exciting. I study video editing in Mediamatic. Mediamatic has a great impact in my company. I'm very proud to be here. Shukran Imam Si. Uh, Bishop, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Lord God Almighty, Jehovah Jira, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Bana, we call upon you this morning hour as we are in the TRRC sitting. We ask for your Holy Spirit's guidance and direction as we meet. We continue to pray that these meetings will all go well for the common good of all who live in this nation, the Gambia, and of your children that are abroad, living in other nations as well. We pray that truth, forgiveness, and reconciliation and reparation will become a positive thing in this land so that all will return to normal and things will begin to work positively for the common good of all. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you very much, my Bishop, for that. Council, are we ready with uh, this morning's witness? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning to you all. We are ready to proceed, so I ask that the usher kindly bring the witness in. Thank you.
I, Sheriff Sise, do, do swear that I'll speak the truth. I will speak the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me Allah. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Sise. Welcome to the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say thank you very much for making yourself available on such short notice. As you already know, we have met before. My name is Horeja Balagay, and I will be asking you questions today on behalf of the commissioners. Your um, testimony today will be mainly in relation to the 1996 Denton Bridge incident. We will also address another incident um, in relation to 1997, um, all of which involve members of the UDP who were allegedly victimized. Just the matter for you to know, as your testimony is going on, there is interpretation into the local languages. Therefore, we will have to allow a few seconds in between our speeches to ensure that there is no overlap speaking, no overlap speeches. Do you understand that, sir? I do. Thank you very much. Um, before we go into the two issues that I mentioned, I will begin by asking you a few questions about your biographical information, as well as your professional background. And then after, we will go into the two issues um, that we've, I've just addressed. So first of all, um, in order that it is clear who you are, can you kindly state your full name for the record? Sheriff al Haji Lamin Sise. And what is your date of birth, Dr. Sise? 16, 3, 1942. Currently, what is your profession? Medical practitioner. Can you briefly tell us about your educational background, just so that um, the commissioners have an idea of who you are and your background? Amitage Primary, then Amitage Secondary School, Please continue. And the Methodist Boys High School in Bar Pathos then. The Bo Government School in Serion for the sixth form. University of London, 1961. And Guy's Hospital, Guy's Hospital Medical School. Professional qualifications, the Royal College of Surgeons of, in of Edinburgh first in 1970, and Royal College of Surgeons of England in 1971. And after completing your education and obtaining those um, qualifications, you began your career, is that correct, in the medical field? That is correct. Can you tell us a bit about that? I was employed as medical officer, special grade by the Gambia government in 1972. I was promoted to the level of consultant surgeon Two years later, it's 1974, I resigned the position of consultant surgeon in 1976. I've been in private practice since then. And um, as part of your private practice, um, where did you set up your your facility? 
at the beginning used consulting offices but clinical practice at Westfield Clinic 1987 I was hospital director for a fantastic hospital in North Bank. A year later, about 1989, I was clinic director at the Kuruli Clinic. And I'm still there. So in 1996, your um, medical practice would have still been at Kololi, is that correct? That is correct. Um, can you tell us what kind of medical practice it was? What kind of facilities did you offer? Trained and qualified in the traditional fields of general surgery and trauma. But then along with that, and over the years, you acquire a lot of experience in all sectors of general medicine, pediatrics, and so on. But my main line was general surgery and traumatology. So when patients um, came to your, your clinic, it was a clinic, is that correct? Absolutely. So when patients came to your clinic, um, they would undergo a registration process, is that correct? That is correct. Can you tell us a bit about the registration procedure at your clinic? For the general purpose, we want computerized. So we use a system which was simple. All governments have a registration number beginning with G. If they are male, it's GM. If they are females, they are GF. All non-Gambians, all non-Gambians are registered XM if they are male, or XF if they are females. So that, and then across that is the year of registration. So you have XM, and the year, and then the index, numeric, starting from the first patient we saw at the beginning of every year. So that's the combination of registration fees. So straight away, it indicates which year the patient was seen, whether it's male or female, and uh, Gambian or non-Gambian. So in 1996, you would have kept similar records containing the dates you saw patients, the gender, that sort of statistical information, is that correct? That's correct, yes. This would also include some kind of um, report about their medical condition, is that correct? Depending on the clinical situation and so on. Therefore, bearing in mind the very important and sensitive issue of doctor-patient confidentiality, your testimony here before the Commission is expected to touch upon just generally um, scopes of victimization without divulging specific identifying information. So in that sense, we would expect you to um, assist the Commission by, for example, referring to an individual suffered X type of injuries, or um, there were generally cases of X and Y, so without giving specific um, identifying information. Do you understand that? I do. So I would like to move on to the issue of um, the first main topic, which is about the 1996 Denton Bridge incident. Do you recall an incident that allegedly occurred um, at the Denton Bridge in 1996? Yes, I do. And do you recall the date of that incident? 22nd of September. You were not present at Denton Bridge during um, that particular incident? 
Is that correct? I was in the party approaching Denton Bridge when the incident broke. But you did not witness what happened at Denton Bridge? I did not physically stand at the site of the obstruction or the incident itself. So how did you, um, did you come to find out what happened um, at the bridge, even though you weren't there when those um, events unfolded? The security detail for our, the passengers in our car, I call the executive car, came and reported that there was a major incident there, and it was <coughs> recommended that we return to Banjo or Combo and abort the trip because there was a lot of problem at the, at the bridge. I did not physically stand at the site of what was actually happening because there was so, so a commotion, so, so many cars, and there was uh, the security problem difficulty has arisen so abruptly that the chief of security suggested to Mr. Davo that we better, more prudent to abort his trip. So to be clear, you were in a vehicle with um, Mr. Davo at the time. Um, are you referring to Mr. Oseinu Davo? I am. So you were approaching Denton Bridge on that day when you were given the advice that you should turn around because of um, an incident at Denton Bridge, is that correct? It is correct. So um, what happened next after you turned around? Where did you go next? Apart from the security detail, the other occupants of the car was uh, Mr. Davo himself, and Dr. Boro Suso and myself. So the driver turned around. We had escorts before and after our vehicle and we drove back to Pipeline Road, the residence of Mr. Dabo. This must be between 10 and 11, but I couldn't be absolutely sure about that. But we left the major party of the convoy at the bridge. And did you eventually see some of the members um, of the convoy who ended up going to Denton Bridge itself? Did you yes. subsequently see them? Yes. Can you tell us about that? By 10 o'clock the following day, a number of ill and injured individuals presented at the clinic. I had no prior knowledge of it, but then in the spirit of the ways we work, and the principles that the clinic stood for, I gave instructions that anybody who comes to the clinic should be identified. You get the correct name, you get the address, and you get the age. And that makes them registered as patients of the clinic. On no account should any individual be refused entry. In other words, open the gates of the clinic to whoever gets in there. By the end of the day, we'd seen something like 115 by in three, four days there, we saw a total of 119 individuals. The average age of individuals about 27, a very youngest group. If I may just um, interject there, mm -hmm. the Patients that you saw, the 115 that you saw on the first day, meaning the 23rd of September, um, 1996, 
and then the other patients that you saw in the subsequent days, making it a total of 119, were they all victims of the Denton Bridge incident on the 22nd September? All of them. You began by telling us the ages of um, the victims. You said the average age was 27 years old. Is that correct? That is correct. Can you tell us how old the youngest victim was? Two girls were 16 years. I think they come from Kalini. The youngest age you saw was 16. The oldest was a man from Ken. He was 60 years old, a very energetic, enthusiastic individual. So these 119 victims had children as well as elderly people, is that correct? I would assume that. What about the gender of the 119 victims? Can you tell us, for example, how many were female? 16 were female, the rest were men. And of those 16, two were subsequently grouped in the seriously injured group and required admission. If we can focus on um, the two females who were seriously injured, um, what do you mean by seriously injured? What types of injuries did they sustain? First, the vast majority of the victims had superficial injuries, mainly on their backs and their limbs, upper limbs, like either defensive injuries and maybe like 50% of those was in that category. And what do you mean by defensive injuries? Somebody trying to defend himself or herself. Usually they will be injuries in the arm, the extensive part of the arm and so on. So and you so could tell based on where the injury was located on their body, is that could. what you're saying? Normally if you find somebody with injuries on their back, That's not the defensive. It means that it always a permissive. It allows the individual or the assailant or the whatever to inflict what harm he can do to the individual's back. You also mentioned superficial injuries. Yes. What do you mean by that? What, um, what type of injuries are you referring to? This would be skin cuts, skin abrasions or bruises, not straight for deep cuts. And they are usually sustained by whips or sticks rather than by e equipment like uh, guns or sharp stuff like knives or things like that. There were no sharp injuries, there were superficial injuries. So the type of injuries that you saw allowed you to conclude um, what could have caused it. And you've mentioned things like whips and sticks. Is that correct? Injuries on the back would suggest that the guy who was being beaten exposed his back and laid on a surface and the, with the assailant standing over him and just whipping him. Injuries on the arm would suggest that at least the individual is trying to protect himself or in fact fight back. Now the majority of injuries we saw on the 23rd was a mixture of this. The men always had injuries at the back of the, the shoulder girdle and the upper part of the trunk. The females had injuries on their bottom. It was selectively to hit men at the top, indicating that possibly they just took their shirts off or they tore their shirts off. And the ones with the bottom, for some strange reason, 
didn't have any injuries at the back. But the important thing is, this injury was severe enough to cause skin bruising, and some of them even were bleeding. We had two or three who had secondary sepsis. So by the time they came to the clinic, they were discharging not just blood and serum, but also pus. Some of it stuck to their shirts or things like that. So it's a combination of this. We didn't see any broken limbs. We didn't see any head injuries. And the usually cause of the admission there, three required, required x-rays because of suspected lung injuries. But the majority Majority of 55, 75% of them really had superficial, that, that same uh, category, rather than deep seated uh, or penetrating injuries or things like that. And the superficial being the cuts, the abrasions, um, and the wounds that you've mentioned to us? Yes. Um, I want to focus on a few things that you told us and just get additional information from you. You mentioned what you observed as a medical practitioner based on the wounds that you saw and you were able to draw some conclusions as to what caused it and how that could have happened. Did the victims also tell you about what happened to them at Denton Bridge? Physically, not much, but the, the, sort of the history behind how they were forced off the vehicle how they are arranged, and my impression was they were threatened into lying prone, lying with the face down on the ground, with these soldiers parading within them, beating them one by one, beating them one by one, because you could count. You could count the number of scars on their back. Subsequently, there was a uniform number of four. Everybody had four strips on the back. One individual had ten, but you could count them. So it, it suggests some form of cooperation or coercion. Somebody threatens you, lie down, lie down, and they stand and leisurely just beat you, beat you until you. A lot of them came with that, with torn shirts also. The individuals with uh, defensive injuries, that's with the arms and so on, not much. There were a few who had injuries to the thigh, these were, like I say, thigh and buttock. Uh, uh, Casualties had that uh, difficulty, pain. So what I understand from your testimony is that you observed their injuries and you drew some conclusions about what happened. The victims also provided you with some information about what happened. But your observations and their observations basically um, corroborated each other, like they were consistent. Your own observations and what the victims told you. Is that what you're saying? Except the point where there's an element of almost cooperation with the assailant. Because if you want to, you are aggressive and the individual has defend herself or himself, it would not be in the best interest of the individual to lie on the floor and let the assailant do what he wants to do. I had a distinct impression that most of the injuries were caused on the back, back being beaten. Occasionally the whip, the whip, I can't confirm, but certainly whatever they use, slipped and they had some injuries on the, in the armpits and the thighs. So this could be due to absolute horror, horror, horrified by the threat of the ultimate weapon which was brandished openly to them. That's a weapon. I wasn't there, but and occasionally we had guns or tools. So they were terrified and in, in such a situation, I think the sort of duress, the stress and everything would make them submit the same way that a bad example would be 
the youth submitted. German paratroopers say, sit and he sits. Ten of them can sit and, because they are traumatized physiologically, psychologically, to the point where they feel so helpless that under command they would seem to be cooperating with it. This was the impression I had. Nonetheless, it doesn't take care of the fact that this was a, a, a wicked, unprovoked assault on defenseless men and women with weapons, whatever, even a stick would constitute a weapon in my view. So they were assaulted, they were beaten with marks which lasted for several weeks on the situations of stress. So, so that's a summary of it. Mm. And essentially, it appears as though you're saying what you observed yes. from the injuries and what they told you yes. about what happened was consistent. Absolutely. And the information they provided you was the following day after the incident. Yes. And based on what you've described, a lot of the injuries, you started to talk about two females who were severely injured and were later on referred because of this, um, the seriousness of their injuries. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, de dealing with 115 young people in the, within 24 hour period, we had to uh, adopt a practical approach to this. The clinic at most can accommodate 15 individuals as a limit to our capacity in terms of nursing and equipment and so on. So the formula we adopted was we try to identify the ones who are most seriously affected by this irrespective of, you know, gender or something. And on that basis, we identified 12 who required inpatient attention for drips, first aid care, wound toilets, antibiotics, tetanus cover, and analgesics. 15 of, of those people would fit for that. In fact, we admitted 15 of those. Of those 15, two were the females I spoke about. The rest could be treated as an outpatient basis. The others were given appointments for further investigations like chest X-ray in a situation of two or three people and so on. So if I say two were admitted, it has to be taken in that context. That's two of the worst ones. The worst, I'm talking about the worst of the worst and also ge ge geographical lo location of the individuals because we had clients or patients from all the five major divisions of the country, although most of them were in the greater Banjo area. So that I can only give a rough idea that the reason we admitted this girl 20 years ago was because she in the category of those who are seriously injured. Injury to me is a co <laughs> medically, there's a physical com component of it, and of course the psychological fear component of it. You're not dealing with somebody who's injured in the kitchen, you're talking about somebody brandishing a gun, lying on the floor in the bush and hitting you, and you had to pick up your rags and walk seven kilometers. A lot of them didn't have vehicles. Kololi. So within that context, I cannot specifically say what. I know that in my heart of hearts, they must be seriously injured to warrant an admission. I don't know if that's helpful. No, in fact, that's very, very helpful. Okay. Essentially, 115 um, of the 119 patients were injured, and you had to triage to determine those who were the most severely injured from that group because you had limited capacity. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, based on that, you admitted some patients, um, including two females that you've talked about. 
you also told us, you began to tell us a bit about the psychological state of the victims. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, what was their condition psychologically from what you observed? In all fairness, I was impressed by the level of strength of these individuals. There was nobody crying. Women cried, not these ones. They are hard. They are brave. And they got substance. Nobody was querying anybody. Nobody was blaming anybody. Everyone sat by themselves thinking, and you know, behind that is a resolve that they did not do anything wrong. In the light of that, it helps ease the management. To look at 1,450, and I had, I undertook to see every individual, not let my assistant or the nurse do it. So I'd have the proper insight into really what, not only they were suffering physically, but the impact psychologically and so on, at that period and beyond. So a lot of credit must be given to those. People are injured within five kilometers of the main teaching hospital in Banjo with this capacity to do that and much more. Nursing capacity unlimited. Much easier to walk from Dundee Bridge to RPH. Not one of those guys came there. So I, th I think that's a credit, not just to the morale, but the sort of post-traumatic difficulty or whatever they might have en encountered. Most of those patients I saw for the very first time, and I never saw them again. In other words, at home or wherever they went, they fought hard to make themselves strong. And if you know that by the following by the mass media or something, people you saw in suffering, in pain and so on, came out as if nothing ever happened to them before. So the psychological assessment of it is a bit complicated because you're not dealing with a normal. They are not abnormal. I think they are superhuman. All those we saw is a credit to them. And the battle they were engaged in. So you were impressed by their resolve because of what they displayed and the fact that many of them didn't come back after yes. you treated them the first time. Yes. I want to focus a bit more on the types of injuries. Where, were there any particular injuries or any particular cases that stood out for you? The boy, 35 years old. <coughs> no white collar job. There's been no university, no director. Nothing like that. Black collar job. Technical job, respectable. Painter, plumber, whatever. Married, two children. Disillusionment, political attraction. A born community leader. Finds himself in the UDP. It seems natural. After the incident, He could not say what was the matter with him. Just showed me his scars. And I made a note, scars, so and so, so and so. But he didn't say the complete story. Three days later, he came. Even there, it was from his body language and so on, that I thought he required further attention. And he had been, or allegedly, kidnapped by four men. His actual story was four NIA, but I'm just saying four men. Three of them pinned him down against a wall. The fourth one 
came, tore his trousers off, exposed his penis, and put a lighter flame on his glance. The glance is the tip of the penis, the fleshy part, not the skin part. He said, Doctor, I have never experienced any pain like that in my entire life. And they left him collapsed. And he was left to decide what to do about that. Like most people from Yani, they would be embarrassed. Embarrassed is probably the wrong word. To tell his wife, to tell his sons, to tell his friends, even to tell his colleagues, even to tell me when he came there. Because he told me this six days after the incident. And I showed, he showed me. While the urine comes out, it's called the meatus. It's like a small opening. That's why the urine comes out. That's what sperm comes out. And that is the source of the ability to have an erectile penis to be able to perform sexual intercourse. In other words, you put a big dent in his manhood, his leadership in the African Gambian context and the Yani context, it'd be as if you emasculated him. And These are the untold stories. What was the question again? Now, that's one incident that and just to clarify, Dr. Sise, was that part, um, was that incident as a result of the 1996 Denton Bridge incident or another incident? A lot of these have had multiple arrests. There's no one individual you see. A lot of those are people who are arrested, or not arrested, but who presented at the clinic. Well, I don't know of any particular party militant in the UPP, in the UDP, who was not present at Tending Bridge. Some, while well, this said, some just did not come in there, but he was registered on the, this was on the 23rd of September, that was the first meeting. Then subsequently people dripped in, dripped in, and on the 17th of June 1997, this was almost a year after that, some of those kept re re repeated. Like I say, his injury was on the 9th of June 1997. But he reported to me on the 19th, as if he must have been keeping this within his house and so on for four or five days because he was embarrassed to tell anybody, to show anybody. Because he's a, he's, a, he's a brave soldier. So, and we do it on a serial, you come today, we ride the date, because we don't have a computer system where you come, automatically you get slotted out to your file or whatever it is. A lot of these individuals you saw, all the five who came together had been seen subsequently or previously. Some I've seen six times. He, in particular, I saw four times. And he told me this on the fourth visit. So if I may just um, say what I understand from your testimony, this 35-year-old gentleman was part of the Denton Bridge incident in 96. He was one of the victims. But this issue of the um, of what was meted out to him in his um, sexual organ happened in June of 1997. 97 years. And this was by um, NIA, allegedly he members said, of yes. the NIA, yes. National Intelligence Agency, is that correct? I think it would be a mistake to put things together on the sort of um, Denton Bridge because there are lots of things leading up to that and there are lots of things which in fact accelerated after that. We don't have a 1996 
fine. We have a patient pile. And this consistent assault on them was there before the bridge and continued after the bridge, especially facing up to the Brikama uh, Congress. So an individual who's been traumatized will have the same file. It will be a problem for me to say what preceded what, but we do know, for example, that this delivery was in September 22nd. And this other incident I'm talking about, the penalty, was in 1997, in June. But it's on the same individual, and it's the same thing that builds up the character of the individual and the level of the atrocities. And it's very helpful that we have some records from you because it allows us to determine which incident happened when, even if it relates to the same individual, because you would have recorded the date. So we have that record and that's clear. So this gentleman suffered some um, harm during the Denton Bridge incident in 96 and similarly suffered other harm in 1997. So that's very clear. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you about something you mentioned in your statement, still focusing on the 1996 Denton Bridge incident. You mentioned a woman who was pregnant at the time, who sustained injuries as a result of that incident. Can you tell us a bit about her? I was scared when somebody told me that this particular woman was pregnant. And, you know, she didn't have any specific injuries, I could tell. We were just being precautionary because he walk, she walked from the site. I think she, she lived in Pakao and had to walk all the way back. So, but there was no indication of injury. She came to the clinic to check, and we checked and found that, in fact, she had no physical injuries or anything that would alarm or damage or compromise the pregnancy. I mentioned it just to indicate the scope of the trauma, which you had no respect of state of pregnancy or the age of the individual or any disability, you know, with the individual. Because we had people who are not very well, who had been subjected to a tour lasting two weeks with a lot of physical and, uh, you know, challenges they had to meet in a very difficult, almost uh, vicious political campaign. So on top of that, you arrive for the penultimate meeting or the last program People, some people maybe would not have had lunch that day, people would not have had dinner that day, thirsty, and then you're subjected to this, and you had to walk all your way back to wherever you in Serekonda, Bakao, and things like that. So if somebody, you've noticed that somebody's been pregnant five months, a very vulnerable period in her pregnancy, you know, it was out of concern that I listed her as one of those we saw, and we did see her, but happily there was no complication to pregnancy. And you mentioned that some of the victims, you had to refer them elsewhere. Yes, this was, um, normally I said, they would beat them on their backs because it's, it's easy to you know, conceal it, you put a gown on it, you wouldn't know. No facial injuries, no frost injuries. Maybe there are sort of uh, defensive injuries in the back and the foot. But the majority of the trauma was inflicted in the back. Now, he had one in the lower part of the chest. It wasn't a flat bar whip, it like a poncho. He had difficulty in breathing. All the criteria we suggest internal chest injury. At worst, you got to do an x-ray, make sure you see I got the pneumothorax, that air going in the lung. Well, that's, that's. They presented at 7 o'clock in the evening. 
I, I was actually called in an emergency, three of those. He was one of those. They did not want to be admitted, actually said it. Because maybe they were arrested, the story was, the story was they were arrested by Kama, taken elsewhere, they said, NIA, subjected to this thing, released before they went, I surmise, before they returned to Brikama, they came to the they came to the, they came to the clinic and they were answers to go back, you know, as every anybody would. And what I said, what I noted was that requires to come and have a chest X ray. But I did not see him again, this particular individual. Now the other guy he had a big, big hematoma. A hematoma is a, is a bruise underneath the skin containing blood. That happens when you have a soft tissue injury beneath the skin. It bleeds and the blood collects there. Blood pushes pressure on the nerves and the bones and the joints. He wasn't able to walk or sit or things like that. He also had to have X-ray of the lumbar spine. I'll just give you this. Because it indicates that uh, the, the, my records will show that he was to do that, but I had no sort of uh, jurisdiction to go beyond the treatment I can give at nine o'clock in, in the night, or to advise the individual to follow it up. But none of those who I recommended chest X-rays or lumbar spine X-rays came back. If I may just um, interject there, Dr. Cisse. Um, so th this group was also from the 1997 NIA incident, and I think, and we will come to that, but I just wanted to ask you two more questions about 1996, and then we will take all the information you have about 1997. As okay. part of the 119 victims that you saw at your clinic, did any of them um, succumb to their injuries? Luckily, nobody. Nobody, we lost no one. And this is at the clinic itself, right? Yes. We said nobody died at the clinic. Do you there was a, uh, can I go? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. There was a 59-year-old man, although admittedly he had previous history or concurrent history of tobacco-related bronchitis. Uh, he was beaten very s viciously because every knew, everyone knew by imp you know, implication or by whatever that he was the musician extraordinary for the UDP before that any other but that Everybody identified him as such and so on. So he stood out. He was singled out from those who, who, you know, were occupants of the, I'm not sure which of the two main drugs. And from what I had, they concentrated on his fingers, because that's the dummy pain. Considerably, he also had chest injuries. When he came in fact, we put him on a drip, straight away resuscitation of the body, and luckily he improved the breathing and so on and so on. He was there three or four days until he felt better. And one of the things with this is after the incident, every time somebody misses a relative, they wonder if he's dead. Because the regime doesn't really try and alleviate fears or respond to the fears and the rights of ordinary, party me ordinary members of society. So you had to go from one hospital to the other, find out from neighbors and sometimes from prisons whether your relative is alive or whatever. In that instance, so they verified that he was, but he was under pressure to go home. This was the thing. He went home with medication. 
and we learned, you know, I think a week or two later, that he died at home. So do you, so, yes, please, do you so believe that this um, musician died as a result of the absolutely, injury? Absolutely, absolutely. And I won't ask you for names, of course, um, so please continue and tell us what you wanted to say. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say that uh, You know, some of the provisions in the ethics of doctor-patient relationships but he died at the hands of the series. Thank you very much for providing that information, right. Dr. Cisse. That's very helpful to understand what really happened um, during that incident and the consequences thereafter. Apart from the 119 victims that you um, treated from that incident, did you treat any other individual apart from those um, UDP supporters? I did not see, no one was identified. We did not register, and we therefore did not treat any person in that, following that incident who was not a UDP supporter. In other words, they were part of the combatants, well, the security forces. We did not see or treat anyone at the clinic with injuries related to that incident. So in fact, all of the victims that you treated were UDP supporters Absolutely. or members. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Chairman, probably during um, a private session, I will provide um, additional information that we would like to tender as exhibits in relation to Dr. Cisse's um, testimony, um, but it's confidential information that we do not want to address um, during this public session. With your leave, I will do that um, at another time. Thank you. So Dr. Cisse, you've provided us with um, a lot of information about what happened in 1996. You began by telling us that some of the victims of 1996 also suffered additional harm. And um, you mentioned the case of a 35-year-old who was det allegedly detained by members of the National Intelligence Agency, um, and then suffered um, essentially sexual torture. You also mentioned another, um, an older person who suffered injuries and had to um, undergo a chest x-ray. And these, I believe, are in relation to the 1997 incident. So can you tell us what you know about the 1997 incident? Curiously enough, a lot of those who report do so at night. It's, it's just, they come at night. I don't know what the reason of this would be, whether they were scared to present at a clinic, a non-government clinic, or or what? And that makes the management much more complicated for me. Because if you need laboratory facilities, you need an X-ray, you need, in fact, additional nursing support, you do not. It's not so. It's, it's much easier during the day and night than at night. A lot of those following the 1996 one would come in the evening. Sometimes in groups of three, four, or five, like the other one, five of them. I don't know who, somebody asked me this, at the investigator, who brought them? I do not know, because usually you find them at the clinic. And since our sort of uh, 
rule of combat is whoever comes, there's an open door. All you need is you must identify the individual. And whoever comes, I must see. Don't say go or come. I must see. You mean what was the prerogative is to provide as much help as possible and at the appropriate time and have it recorded. This was what we were following up, up to now. So even after 1996, we had event on through the elections, remember? And then after the elections and so on, up to when the Gambia decided. Do you recall the date of the 1997 incident? It's the, that's in June, 13th of June. Can you tell us, um, as far as you know, what happened um, on the 13th of June, 1997? They came in two days after the alleged torture. In other words, they were tortured on the 11th. And you go further in the records, you find that, in fact, this particular individual with the penal, he was arrested on the 9th and he was tortured on the 11th, and he came to the clinic on the 13th, within the same week. In other words, maybe, I said to myself, if he was tortured with so much pain, why did he wait 24, 48 hours? By that time, of course, the evidence was there. I mean, if you, if you burn a flesh, it takes maybe six weeks more before this car disappears. So, to answer your question, it was the 13th of June, 1997, when those five individuals came. But one of them had had this penal thing with him, with him three, four days earlier, and never reported it. And when these um, five individuals mm -hmm. And from what I can see in the list that you provided us, um, you refer to six individuals. Yeah. When these individuals came to your clinic, mm -hmm. did they tell you who had tortured them? All the usual, what they call it? The usual suspects, they say NIA, because they never identify names, so I just say alleged. But the story is always that. The torture is not done at the victim's house or in the public street or the market. They do it under detention when there are no witnesses. Naturally, the guy will say, well, I four men or two women, four. Do you know why you are taking it? Sometimes they do, but if sometimes you don't. And all I indicate in, the, in, in my records, card records, the time they arrive, I indicate that and the allegation, and the date, because those are important. Those ones, they say they were uh, arrested on the 9th. They were taken to uh, NIA, the 11th, 9th uh, NIA, 11th was the torture, and the 13th was when he came to the clinic. And when he was coming, this particular guy, when he was coming, he came with, the other guy with the back who couldn't walk, and the one with the suspected puncture, long hair, that is that. The other one were two with serious wounds on the back. And they all came in one car, as far as I remember. I don't know who dropped them, but it didn't matter. The clinic wasn't going to tolerate identifying what. We just look at the individual and see and try to do it at no cost to the individual. And before I interrupted you earlier in your testimony, you started to tell us that one of them um, suffered from hematoma, is that correct? That is correct. Can you tell us more about that? Because that individual, when you talk to him like that, you won't know. Ask him to sleep and lie down. You will be horrified. From the shoulder blades down, there were 10, we counted 10 large strips of scars, each at least what, 10 inches and about two or three. In other words, you either use a flat bar 
or nothing sharp. But the injury was concerning the lower back, the lower spine. And two or three days after, that formed a big swelling, a subcutaneous was in other words, the skin may look okay, but beneath it is the, is the hematoma, the blood clot. He found it impossible to sit, he couldn't stand, let alone walk. Quite apart from that, he had other deep wounds on the thigh, inner part of the thigh. So Sorry, what do you think caused those so-called dimples in the inner thigh? Could you ascertain what the cause was? I don't, I can't imagine, I, I don't think there is a necessity for them to use multiple weapons. Because they, they, they wanted something which, which will not kill the individual. They wanted something which might not attract attention or less than a close examination. In other words, you know, it, hurt them where people can't see. And then it becomes their responsibility to prove that they have been assaulted. So the favorite position I found was back injuries. They are flat. Maybe they don't know that you can do a lot of harm inside the body by an injury which is even not penetrating. It doesn't have to be penetrating. Contusions, nerve injuries, ligament injuries, even organ rupture can happen just with a flat injury. You don't have to have a knife for that. So consequently, the sacroiliac point, where you sit on, actually where you stand on, it takes your weight. That got edematous because of the trauma, because the hematoma pressing on it. Subsequently, he wasn't able to walk. So he was using a crutches by March 2000. The fact that that got steadily worse, it got worse for a while and then improved. Because the interesting thing about nerves is nerves can undergo swelling, edema and so on, which can, re which can resolve over a period. You can also have neuropraxia where the injury itself can cause a shock and you have sciatica. Sciatica means pain going down the leg and numbness. Not from a nerve cut. Nerve cut is the final degree where it's neurot messy, where the cut, nerve is cut. If it's cut, it can't repair. It's like the heart muscle or something. You also have as a message, neurot messy. So my theory is in December, he had the injury, uh, 1997, going to because I saw him on several occasions, up to uh, 2000, I think it was March, then he had to go on crushes. And then over the period, the swelling subsided. He was on continuous ED, I, I know, because he, I gave him ED from work and so on. And he got slightly improved, improved, improved. It is possible that the pressure on the lab relaxes. And he had a neuropraxia, neuropraxia is nerve shock, or even at azon medicine, which is the fatty layer gets disrupted, but the nerve tissue itself is intact. And that gives, provides the opportunity for the nerve to regenerate, not the nerve cell itself, but the nerve covering. This is why he improved slightly during the last few, because uh, I last saw him, I think, in June of 2006. Although he came on and off and so on, that would explain the cycle events: getting bad, unable to walk, and then stabilization, and then suddenly getting better. Subsequently, of course, you know, other things took their toll, and uh, I don't know if the individual is available right now. And all these were as a result of the injuries inflicted upon, allegedly, by the NIA? Those ones I indicated, I'm absolutely sure they were. And because you were able to observe this individual over a number of years, yes. you saw how it affected his condition um, over time. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. 
These are very serious injuries that you've described as a result of torture allegedly inflicted by the National Intelligence Agency. Where you've mentioned about six individuals, well, the list contains um, six. Are there any other um, injuries that you noticed um, over time as a result of what happened to these um, six individuals? Well, I and my staff have been digging through our files, but these are the ones we actually can uh, testify and say we saw because there's evidence of it in our attendance register, in our card system, and uh, these are the ones that we have been able to uh, highlight. Like I say, the majority may be just long suffering, patient people enduring their pain for expediency because of embarrassment. Because Gambians are very reticent. Men, probably more ch chauvinistic than Italians, I don't know. But to the best of my knowledge, these ones I indicated to you are the ones I am so. And the individuals you've talked about, the patients from 1997, um, were they all men? Yes. 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 And from what you've said, um, they suffered severe injuries and these are the individuals that you could identify. Yes. But I understand from what you've said that mm -hmm. you believe that there are many more cases, um, but these are the ones you were able to dig out and talk about here today. Is that yes. correct? Yes, that is correct. Now, as a medical practitioner and from a medical standpoint, oh, is there something you'd like to say, Dr. C? I don't know. It's, it's too big. I mean, there's a, an overlay of, you know, the popular word. Would I wanted to talk to the escort. Uh, the one who just, just a second. I'll have someone come up to you. All right, we do that. Just a second. Can we? Yeah. The mic. Well. Interplay here, medical, the medical part is the underlying um, political situation which really is the cause of the thing. Um, and Dr. Cisse, I'll, if, I'll just, if I may interrupt, I understand that you would like to have a break, so if I can just ask Mr. Chairman if we can take a break and allow the witness um, to come back after the break and continue the testimony. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Council, for that. Do we do uh, the 30-minute break now, or would you want um, uh, us to continue? when he comes back and uh, then take the break or what? I'm in your hands now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I, I would suggest that we um, allow the witness about 10 minutes and then we continue because I'm at the end of my um, questioning and so I can allow the commissioners to ask a few questions, perhaps uh, allow him to make a final statement and then we, we're finished with this witness. So a break of 10 minutes um, perhaps would be ideal. Splendid. That's okay with me. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Dr. Sise. Welcome back. I would like, I would like to remind you that you're still under oath. Um, we're almost at the end of your testimony. During your testimony, you told us about 119 patients that you saw as a result of the 1996 um, Denton Bridge incident on the 22nd September. You told us that those individuals um, had allegedly suffered all these injuries at the hands of the security forces at Denton Bridge. You also testified about um, another group of patients, six individuals who suffered um, injuries as a result of torture in June 1997. You told us that they were arrested on the 9th of June. Um, they underwent torture on the 11th of June, and you saw them on the 13th of June. And this was allegedly at the hands of the National Intelligence Agency, the NIA. Now, having treated all these victims, um, particularly in 96 and 97, can you tell us from a medical standpoint what kind of impact such injuries would have had on the lives of the individuals that you, um, that you treated, just generally? It would appear to me that one of the most obvious factor was the fact that these individuals would not feel secure in this country if any of them is ill or at the wrong end of the security apparatus. Because people would prefer, supporters of the UDP would prefer to go a non-government facility even if they needed to. The tragedy of having 119 injured people leave Banjul and go to a private clinic, a small clinic, completely out of the center, defies description from the medical point. What was stopping them from going there? What is the scare? Why do they turn their backs on the facility that they own? Taxpayers, heritage, whatever. The facility is for, even if the staff are maybe 90% non government it doesn't matter. That scare is a nice thing that factors, which denies them due access. And medical, I recognize this as one of the most, the saddest things ever. The, once I saw they weren't mimicking, they were bona fide injured. But people just really turn their backs on it, it's blind faith or, or denial. And this, is, this will be a sad thing for the country to, depending on politi political experience, you go political, if you are against the government or something, you are part of the government machinery, the government institutions. The government best, what, what the government stands for, why do they have to be denied that? That's the one thing that stands out in my mind. Apart from that, I think the whole problem lies with the government and the way they use and manipulate the security apparatus making the other individual the enemy. <laughs> Non-government are not enemies. But you've got to get that thing out of one's mentality, or out of one's psychology, one's every, you know. And I think one of the important things that should emerge from a commission like this is to state that it's a fundamental flaw in the abuse of power because it pervades into everything, transportation, job seeking, medical facility, ferry, whatever. You've got to break that myth. The others are just small 
opportunistic things that you know the hospital said no you can't you can't you can't treat this guy because he's this party or that sort of where does it come from? And in fact, I want to ask you a question about that. Considering what happened to your patients and why they came to see you in the first place, wasn't it a risk for you to actually treat all those patients? We're talking a large number of victims from a single incident. Wasn't it a risk for you considering what was happening at the time? I feel the risk only when you said it. It never occurred to me. I mean, maybe I'm a bit <laughs> dim in the head. I know over the period, this is really going from, from the beginning of the formations. Some people have the capacity to conceal their faith, their beliefs, and their support. I come from a clan who do not share that, I think, if you. Your chairman will tell you that Nyaninkas are very down to us and can, and can be the most frustrating problem for any individual if you want to deny them certain basic rights. In answer to your question, maybe I should have considered those as threats, but only now do I need, you have to have a bodyguard, you have to have. Of course, the marabouts take part of the credit for it. <laughs> but no, I, I, I think maybe there's a risk. But I think the, the country or what I would have denied myself would be a far greater risk. So I didn't consider it crucial. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sise, for your courage at the time, and thank you for your testimony. Um, I have concluded my questions, so I will yield the floor to the commissioners who may ask you additional questions and then allow you to make a final statement at the end. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council, for that. And uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Sise, uh, thank you very much. You have always been a, uh, an inspiring role model for the boys who grew up in Bansan. We all wanted them to uh, follow your footsteps in education and uh, service. And uh, that is still there, always inspiring, and uh, always brave. Thank you so much. Uh, for sharing with the Commission the untold stories of massive brutality visited on innocent and uh, defenseless uh, civilians by the security forces who were acting as um, agents um, uh, of the state. I hope um, uh, we don't have this kind of thing repeated in our country again, but a big thank you to you for agreeing uh, to come and testify before the Commission and they share these summer stories. Very difficult, but you stayed uh, brave in dealing with it. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, you have a, a point you wanted to make? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sise, for your very lucid testimony. And thank you also for your benevolence in treating those patients free of charge at a very critical stage in their lives. You have described some very critical cases of human rights violations against some persons who came to your clinic for medical attention. These persons are of great interest to the TRRC, not only for, their, for hearing what happened to them, but also for their personal interest in terms of reparations. So we are calling out to them if they have heard your evidence that they do present themselves before the Commission and uh, state their cases so that they will be eligible for reparations. We are looking forward to hearing from them either as direct beneficiaries if they are still alive and if they are not alive, if they are close members of their families who can come in as indirect victims 
to tell the commission what happened to their loved ones. We thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sam, you have any questions to ask? Or, yeah, uh, uh, Imam Diallo. Sise, I want to congratulate you for your bravery and for standing to maintain your profession and ensure that you do justice to Gambian citizens. What you did at the time these things were happening is a manifestation of your truthfulness to your profession. Very few doctors would have attempted or accepted to attend to these people in, in that situation. Thank you very much for what you have done for your nation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, uh, Dr. Sisi, would you have um, some closing remarks to make? If you do, please pro proceed. Thank you, commissioners and all organizers in support of this almost landmark commission and with its objectives. The problem with most developing countries is to put institutions at the back and personal power and greed in the upfront. This choice is an enemy to development. Now, fortunately, this is the first time in Africa, or in fact the world, where you have a situation as bizarre as this, where a leadership who's not been tried, a leadership who has not got the mandate, the, the, the like of the people, is put in absolute total charge of the lives or the death or the prosperity or the poverty of its people. Institutions must be built on fair, competent, with clear mandates and clear authority, not individuals. The experience in Rwanda after probably the worst, certainly worse than what we experience here, where genocide is committed by neighbors against neighbors, school children against classmates, purely on ethnic lines. That's not the situation here. Here we have a crime committed by an individual and his entourage undermining the authority and the independence of the system for their own greed. It looks simple certainly much simpler than Rwanda's, but Rwanda has got completely torn around. They are now, I use the word civilized, not from buildings, but the attitude of the people. There's more social cohesion in tribes who were just butchering each other's children from that happened in Rwanda. There was so much inveterate hatred of the individual. We haven't got to that point. Fortunately, when the people of the Gambia decided, when Gambia decided, we hope that's the beginning of the total revolution that we've experienced over the last 25 years. My concern is maybe This commission started too late. Maybe it's not been empowered 
as much as it should. I was surprised when I think the council said that we are not a court. It's a bit disheartening because I think there's a lot of investment in this abroad and the country and the ordinary people who volunteer to leave their jobs and come and testify that something substantial should happen now. Not 20 years from now, the guys who benefited from this are the 20 to 30 year olds of 1992. In other words, they serve the middle third of their life in prosperity, ill-gotten. Houses they did not build, facilities never would have achieved in normal circumstances. Now, 2019, we say enough is enough. Meanwhile, 20 years, 20 years of hardship and toil, during which a lot have shed their blood, thousands have been driven to same countries as refugees, properties have been confiscated, life has been devastated. And now we have a commission which is not really empowered to do anything, just find out. Space of life is at most six years, 20 years to build something, 20 years and then the 40 years for so and so. I don't think this country can afford to do that. For a commission of this multitude, in terms of the negative implications of the country, there ought to be something that should be more manifestly high profile to be able to remedy the fundamental things which are there. Because the guys who profited 20 years ago are still running this show. And this is the tragedy of it. So I hope that it will be possible for this commission to empower itself. That's not correct lawyers, when you talk to lawyers. You can't, you can't give yourself power. But I mean, the, work, the amount of work and intention you put in this is very encouraging. But some people will prefer a lot more than this in terms of its executive role and the impact it can have. Even within, because the way it's going, it will go another 20 years before all the formal support. Because if you spend sort of two, weeks, two days just looking at the medical evidence, covering just one or two days, what about the gigantic social problems which are under, underlying the political situation. Because all this answer, all the answer lies somewhere. The dispenser, the guy in the ferry, these are all permutations of the same thing. So it's a huge task, but it is good that we are beginning. But it would be a tragedy for you to complete all the things identify the key problems. Everybody says what the key problem is. To do something drastic and something meaningful. We have heard in the grapevine that certain countries have indicted certain individuals for various times. But it's my view that we ought to do the first in Paris. In Paris. Before you go to Ghana to answer for Ghanaian robbers being killed or whatever. What, what, about, what about the area, the thumbprint, the main thing that is really causing this? Should other countries take it from our example or do we have to wait until somebody does something? I think this is a moral issue which you as commissioners have to accept. It's to be done properly and expeditiously in the sense of justice the sense of justice. I'm looking at it, Chairman, from the medical, narrow medical perspective of what I saw happen just for a few people who, ethnic Gambians, civil Gambians, 
there, they got everything in the book to qualify as medical, as, as Gambian citizens being denied access to a government facility on the basis of political, which in fact was ra wrongly flawed. I think it's important to know what the truth is, what to do, but experience here to be able to ratify, you know, some of the, a lot of the guys who are, are still in punishment for what they suffer. And it be something to say, okay, now, We've got this thing, we've got to process this, we've got to have a, a judicial angle to it, because this is, this is not judicial, it's not a criminal court, you can't exercise anything like that. To be able to combat our wishes, the wishes that make some of us leave our work to come and testify, just to correct a small thing, to make it wholesome. We've, I think the people have got, nobody would refuse to come to the commission, so it's not the commission to use what it has got. To do what you know now is the main cause of the problem. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to take any more of your time except to thank you for giving me the privilege. And whatever I did is what the Colony Clinic stands for since the beginning. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much indeed. The bravery hasn't diminished one bit. <laughs> Thanks for your service, and uh, it's a pleasure for us and an honor to have you to come and testify before the Commission. Council, do you have any points I'm to raise before we go into a yes. pri a private session? Y yes, well, it was just uh, to remind that we may need to go into private session for the admission of the documents. But that said, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Cisse for such a wonderful testimony. Uh, it's highly appreciated. And also to allay your fears uh, that the commission would do what is expected of it. Okay. The recommendations would come. And uh, we are considering when is the best time to make what recommendations. But they would surely, surely come. But uh, just also to reiterate that there are certain expectations that are beyond the remit of this commission and fall squarely on the lap of the politicians. Uh, when the recommendations come, I hope that the Gambian public would hold the, the public officials accountable as to how they deal with the recommendations that this commission or other commissions would submit to them. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma Council, uh, for that. Uh, we will see you again Monday morning at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Okay. Unique energy. 12 months of abundant sunlight. Why don't you switch to solar? Never stay in the dark. Save big. From your home, office or the streets, solar is the best. Switch to solar and save money. Panels, batteries, inverters. Unique energy. 224-7777. Info at uniqueenergygm.com. Has happened, will happen, may happen, is happening. Let us know. Send an email to info at btv.gm or call us 611-1666. Paradise TV, reflecting Gambia. Unique energy. Katan nyofula, tiloba manla, anyama. Miyat nadung, ita falinna, ita solata. Kana sonye tu dibokono. Andum isela kudo mabo. Kaboyla suwal kono, katila ofisoto, katambe dolto. Sola la beno. Faling, ita solato, yela kudo mabo, kabo panelolto. Batriol, katafo invata, unique energy. 224 
between an other media house is that we have the best quality materials. We're working here, it's exciting. I study video editing in Mediamatic. Mediamatic has a great impact in my company. I'm very proud to be here. This is Mediamatic. Mediamatic. We are the media. How do you know Social media. Alalla jero nala mirror nya tala an intel na facebook page oto ptv gambia na instagram ptv gambia twitter ptv gambia and in youtube also na app o fanang download nole google play store and in apple store ptv gambia la fam felendo